Hey, thanks, Wendy, to have me back on. I always have fun when we do a Zoom meeting and get to interact with a lot of uh, different folks from around the world. So thank you for inviting me again. Um, it, tonight, you know, it's very interesting. And I was talking to Wendy before we started, before you guys came in about some of the aspects of mediumship and different types of training and things like that. And we can go over different ones, after, you know, when I talk to you guys a little bit more, find out where you are and, and what's going on. Um, when I first started to do my training, obviously before that, I've had, a, I've had the ability since I was a child, but once I started to do my official training, which I'm gonna say, which was about 25 years ago, a structured training, I, I was lucky because I did it through a spiritualist church. So I had access to the American style, but they also had a lot of uh, British uh, mediums come in and I studied with a few of them too. So I was lucky because I saw that in my training, both different styles and they're distinctly different. You can use different aspects of each style. Um, but the first thing is when you're developing, you want to develop your own system, your own, what you're comfortable with, the way spirit works with you. And then you can kind of decide which way you want to go. Do you want to go direct when you actually pick, you know, let's say you're with a group and you want to go directly to a person and bring in their loved ones, or you want to throw out and say, I have someone here. And then you go through the description and then someone says, oh, that's for me. That's indirect. And a lot of British do that when they do groups and things like that. They'll do it actually in a one-on-one -on -one sitting too. Let's say you want an American, you want to tap, talk, tap into your mom. I would just try to like, contact directly to your mom to bring it through. Sometimes the British, what they would do is they would say, oh, I have someone here. Um, and then they, they would just give that information and you guys would pick it up. Um, so there's different styles there, but that's kind of, you know, it, that's a little bit farther down the road. I think the main thing is to be able to get you guys on a, you know, stick to a structured form of where you, your development can, can um, build off. The foundation is extremely important. Um, like I said, I was lucky when I worked with the spiritualist church because they were old school and they really held you to certain standards, which they didn't let you screw around, pardon the expression. It's like, you know, you, you just couldn't ad lib things. You couldn't just make things up. I remember doing classes where we used to do like platform practice, which is group readings after we did our development in classes. And we'd had volunteers that let us do uh, practice in an auditorium and stuff, which was great. And you'd get up there. And when you first did it, you could stand there for two or three minutes in front of 25 people and not get anything. But that's kind of the deal you make with spirit that you're going to develop what you want to develop in order to help people. And then eventually things started to come in. And then, you know, we all learned together. Um, it was a great experience if you want to do that type of uh, those type of readings. It's different than doing one on one. I don't know if anyone's done both of them, but you'll feel a different energy. OK, I suggest you do the one on ones first. Get to you know get close and understand that energy. Then have, if you have an opportunity, you can start with small groups, and then you will see the energy come to you a little bit differently. And that takes practice. All this takes practice. I know Jennifer, you said you're you're starting to build up your trust, which is extremely important. People have trust problems for years, okay. But then you get to the point where you're kind of like, you know, you've done so many readings and stuff, and you're like, no, I know what I'm getting. The sitter's just not getting it. And, you know, you'll start to give yourself a break. So um, that's all part of mediumship development also. How you treat yourself, how to trust, how to have self-confidence, dealing with the ego. All these things have to be brought into context with your development and what you want to get out of this. Some people don't, don't want to do um, groups or readings at all. They just want to connect with spirit, maybe just for family members and stuff, which is great but you still want to st start out with that same foundation of, of learning the background on certain, um, on certain, um, how do I want to put it? There's so much different information out there about so many different process, processes that it's important that you learn a lot of the different uh, terminology. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Because a lot of times people will overuse certain words or expressions and they don't really mean what they're, what they're saying. 
with the spiritualist churches, we had access to a lot of the people that did a lot of research on the afterlife back in the turn of the century, not 2000, 1900. And these people were like, they were wealthy, they were educated, and they did a lot of research. There were a lot of books. So I would suggest you do pick up some books. On, you can get them online or they can get them at the library for free and stuff. And some of the old time is that real leaders, Andrew Jackson, I think, because that way you'll start to learn what certain things mean. Because, you know, we talk about mediumship, we talk about trance medium and channeling. I mean, there could be 15, 20 different type of sub chapters within mediumship itself. Okay. Physical mediumship. So it'd be nice if you guys learned a lot of the terminology. I mean, you don't have to do it like study and stuff like that, but do it kind of as a hobby because so when you're talking to someone and someone starts talking about physical mediumship and ectoplasm and stuff like that, you kind of know what's going on, but you can also tell if they know what they're talking about because as you move along in your development and you do end up finding a mentor or a teacher, you want to be able to get a feeling from that teacher that they can't, they know what's going on. Okay. And they know the background of mediumship and, and connecting with spirit. That's very important because otherwise what happens is you can end up taking up, taking on bad habits from some of these teachers that, that just make it more difficult for you. And it, it, it just makes your, your connection to spirit much more difficult in your, in your development. That's what I'm trying to say. Quick question, a uh, quick uh, comment to Philip about taking uh, time off because life makes us take time off like last year happens all the time. If in your development, you're doing very well at some point and then things just slack off, that's natural. It's going to happen. As long as you're still into it and they still want to work with them, they will come back and they will bump you up. That's the expression we use. They'll bump you up to another level. And then you might go quiet for six months or a year. And then the next year you might go Zoom. So they're always there, but they know when we have to be human and we have human things to deal with, okay? Another thing before I get into some questions and some other areas, have boundaries, set boundaries. I know, Philip, you said that, that someone came to you in a car. You want to be able to set up times where your people can come through. When you do your development, if you're doing it mostly on your own, you wanna set up times and stick to like a certain day or a certain hour of the week and say, I want to sit down with my guides. I want to get better connection with spirit and work with it that way. It's like a class. It is. It's a class you have with spirit. They set times and you stick to it and you have to be disciplined about it. Okay. The more disciplined you are about it, the more serious you're about it, the better foundation you have is it will take you as far as you want to go. And then you'll also be able to mentor and teach other people the right way, okay? So it's a lot of the things that they don't teach in books. I mean, people talk about techniques and stuff and techniques, I was thinking this afternoon about tonight and stuff. And a friend of mine, when I first started bartending years ago, like long, <laughs> many years ago, I was, you know, a friend of mine that was running the bar said, you know, I don't know how to bartend. He said, Joe, I could teach a monkey to bartend. He goes, you know people. He goes, that's what I want as a bartender, is someone that knows people. And you know, and, and, you know, when you hang out in a bar, and bartenders that are more personable, they know how to read people, those are the ones that are most successful. It's not the ones that uh, you know, necessarily know the techniques. And it's the same thing with mediumship. You will learn the techniques along the way, and hopefully you won't learn some bad habits. And once you learn the foundations, that'll go along but there's a lot more to being a medium than just certain techniques, okay? And that's being compassionate. That's doing it for the right, the right, uh, the, the right purpose. That's knowing when to say something and not to say something. That's knowing when to put your ego to the side because it's not about you, it's about them, okay? These are all disciplines that you have to really stick to. Um, and if you do, you'll have a wonderful, wonderful experience working with spirit. And every once in a while, you'll be like, that just blew my mind, which, which just happened. And, and that happens to me, you know, after many years of doing this, sometimes I do readings and I'm like, wow, that's just so cool. So that's just a few things I want you guys to think about. Another quick thing too, 
if you're working alone or isolated or something like that, it's good to have someone that you can bounce questions off of. I and mean, that's really important. I actually, I'll make myself available. If you guys have questions along the line or something, you can email me anytime. I'd love to talk to you because it's so interesting. Excuse me, when I was doing my development, there was always like one or two person, people I could call up at like, like I said, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night and just discuss certain things because you run across certain situations like, how do I handle this? What do I do with this? Or how do you do that? And you'll help each other. So you're not, you're not, um, you're not alone and stuff. So I remember one, one example, I was in a class with a friend and I said, I'm seeing something and, but I can't really make out what it is. I'm just getting a piece of it. And he said, Joe, I just tell him to span out. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes like, you know, you like on a, a telescopic lens or something, just tell him to back up. And I did. And all of a sudden I could see a bigger picture. So it's just simple little things like that you can pick up from talking to other people and then you can try it out. I'm like, oh my God, this works. So, so if you can do that, if you do have questions on the bigger pictures of mediumship and stuff like that, email me anytime, I'll get back to you. Just say, Joe, I saw you in a Zoom meeting at, uh, about mediumship and uh, I'll help you out as much as I can because I love talking about it. I love talking about the experiences. I think it's so, so cool. It's just, it blows my mind because we have the ability to know things that humankind has wanted to know about since the beginning of time. It's incredible. You know, three or 400 years ago, we'd all be burnt at the stake, but that's, you know, you know, maybe in a past life we all were, but I mean, it's really cool, the stuff that we can do and the people you can help. I mean, last year I finished up a book on parents that have lost children. And I've been doing a lot of reading for parents, you know, who want to connect with their children. And um, the amount of healing and relief you can bring to people is, is unimaginable. It really is. And so that's why I take all this stuff really serious. And I hope you guys do too, because it sounds like you already do, which is great. And uh, I want to see you guys do well. And I want to get a reading from you guys <laughs> because us mediums don't always get one. So we're always begging for them. But um, it, you know, also in part of your development, I, I really suggest you guys practice, 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 practice on everyone you can. I mean, if you have a friend that's a medium and you guys want to practice, practice on each other, practice on family members, practice on the phone, practice on Zoom, practice on uh, email. They're all different ways of connecting, but they, they're all the same way. Okay. They, they're going to come, the spirit's going to come through the same way. But practice all those things. I first started when I was practicing on AOL, on instant messenger and email. I can't type. I'm typing, listening to spirit and trying to answer something from the person that I don't even know who they are because I'm typing it in. But I wanted to do it. And, and that, that's the only way I could find people to practice with. Um, so do whatever you can to practice. And you can tell them, say, listen, I'm not, you know, I'm new at this or I'm picking things up, but um, I want to practice and you will get more comfortable with what you're doing. But set your boundaries. Don't feel like you have to talk all the time when you are doing your mediumship. I like to keep things the same way all the time. You know, once in a while, I'll wing it if like, like Philip said, someone comes to me in the car or something like that. But usually if I sit down with someone, there's certain procedures I will go through. I explain the process to whoever I'm sitting with. I ask them if they've seen a medium before, which is important because they have certain expectations. After the reading is done, I do kind of a, a debriefing so that I can answer any questions that might have come up during the reading. Because when I'm doing a reading, I'm, you know, you guys will know that you're kind of out of there and you don't want to have a conversation with the person you're reading. Uh, I mean, the sitter, you don't, yeah, you don't want to have a conversation with the sitter. Yeah, maybe yes, no, or does that make any sense? And that's it, because um, once you get locked in and stuff, you just want that information to flow, and it will. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do your uh, analytical brain to get in the way. So that's, that's, that's an important little thing too. Let the, inf let the information come through, let the, the reader on the sitter try to figure it out. It's not our job to figure out the information. The crazier the information, the better the hits. Okay, so don't try to make out about, you know, I got a purple dog that's bobbing its head in the back of a car. 
You know, I've had that one before. And sometimes that's all you need for the person to say, oh, that's my grandfather. He had one of those bobbleheads in the back of his car and it was purple. That's a true story. So just give them what you get and let them figure it out. And then as you go on, you'll, you'll, you'll learn you know, a little bit more um, your own personality and things like that. So I know I'm kind of all over the place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask if you guys have questions and then I can be a little bit more specific because I know you're at different levels. Hi, Joe. Nice to meet you. Um, I'll be quite honest. I don't know anything about you. Maybe that's a good way of starting off. I, personally, I've been involved uh, with trans work for the last 15 years. Um, I was curious as to whether you actually do trans yourself. I do, uh, I do channeling. I've written two or three books just from channeling. Um, which is a form of trance. Um, trance can take many different levels. You can actually have uh, people that are totally unconscious or um, and do it all the way up to uh, channeling as a form of trance, okay? Um, I did, like I said earlier, I had done a lot of my uh, studying with the Spiritualist Church. I did uh, a few weeks of pastoral skills up in Lilydale, New York, um, which everyone in, the, in, in that particular village are mediums. And we did a, a, a two week overnight uh, training course up there for that particular reason. I've trained with uh, various uh, American and UK um, um, teachers. So it's, it, it's, it's great because I've had the opportunity to, to work with a lot of different other people. But I decided, uh, I still give readings and I've been doing a lot more since the, the last book came out. And, um, but I, I started segueing probably about 10 years ago into writing because I thought I could uh, reach more people and I've written five books, um, a few on signs. Um, I've written, like I said, the children's book. I wrote a book for veterans who had passed over, helping veterans on this side, um, dealing with uh, post-traumatic stress. And, um, and my first love is the signs, all the signs they sent to us, because you don't have to have a background um, in a lot of the stuff that we know uh, to get these signs. And they're just cool, and everyday people get them. And so I try to help them out with that. So it's a long journey. You're always going to be learning stuff. It's fun. And uh, so I wish you well on that. But yeah, so to answer your question, yeah, there are different levels of trance. I do a lighter trance um, as opposed to something deep. Okay. Right, thanks for that. Hi, um, I had a couple of questions. Um, is there a specific exercise that you would recommend that helps to increase the awareness when doing a um, reading? Um, I certainly have noticed that um, when I meditate for 10 minutes, no mind, if I can achieve that, then after that, if I'm working um, with a sitter, then I, I can actualize the benefit of that because I notice it pushes me forward. Yeah, that's a great question because what you really want to do is you're setting your, your system uh, up for that connection. And at the beginning, that's very important. Later on, it'll come much more easy. Whatever, whatever your favorite meditation is, some people listen to music, some people might do something, anything that's gonna block out you know, the everyday world. You don't want distractions. When I give a reading, I tell the sitters, don't be distracted for, for um, at least an hour because I don't want phones, I don't want kids coming in and things like that. But also for the person that's the medium, that's really important too, to get your head in the right space and to get it out of that analytical world. Um, when you're thinking about your job, bills, family, relationships, and all that stuff. So try to find your favorite meditation, music, or whatever um, words you want to use. And there's a million online you can find. Whatever works for you, that just kind of puts you in that great spot. And then, um, you know, you could actually help the, the person sitting there if you want. And then you come out and you say, all right, well, let, let's see what we have. And then you can feel yourself being a little lighter, like you had mentioned, and... Um, and then you can go from there. But, uh, <clears throat> Thank you. My other question was that when you do trance mediumship or channeling, have you had any difficulty with the presence not wanting to leave your physical body or your energy field um, that they, they didn't want to leave? Release. Yeah. Well, that's setting up your boundaries right away. And I would not necessarily get into some type of training like that until you have more experience working with spirit. Because, like I said to Alan, I mean, people, they can actually, different types of trance, they can step into you 
uh, transfiguration. They can come and then actually speak through you. They can be right next to you. I just do an audio of, uh, um, and I listen to them. Um, so I don't want, I have had them come in me and I don't want that. And, and so I <clears throat> don't allow it. And you have a right to say that I don't allow it. Um, you should have a working relationship with your guides, your protective guides, and it, it, any type of entity that's around you that you don't want to have around. If you need be, you can call on your guides to have them removed. And, and you actually see them removed once your clairvoyance gets to that level where you can actually see what's going on um, in the spirit world, in your mind's eye. Um, you can always tap into that. Another thing too is, you know, when you're doing your mediumship, I always ask questions too, because I always figure out what's going on over there. And they'll tell you some stuff, and sometimes they won't tell you, but <laughs> talking to them, you might as well take a shot. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Yeah. But get your, and get your, um, make sure you're in a good mood, meaning you're not too tired. You, you want to make sure you're hydrated, um, not agitated, because all of that just makes extra work for your, for your, uh, for your spiritual self to fight off. So kind of give your spirit a break and just kind of set it up that way. Although we have, you know, we have experimented giving readings in bar rooms and stuff because we had to, you know, that was the deal. And so you can do it, but I wouldn't recommend it because um, that's a little bit more advanced. That's for another, that's, that's for another day, those stories. I just wanted to say that I was glad to find you guys because I recently moved and lost my group that we would meet every week and it's kind of lonely where I am but um, it was that's why I said I saw you last night and I decided to come and give it a try. That's but, great. I'm glad you found the group and you know, I hope you, you continue to come back because these guys do a great job. They have a lot of good mediums on and just answering questions that people have you know every time you meet just write them down so you can answer them and you can um, you'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot. I'm at the very beginning. Um, so I, I've had lots of clairvoyant experiences and objective clairvoyance that over the past couple of years that I'm beginning now to make sense out of. And so I, I've gone through a big life change and things have opened up for me. I think Philip was talking about something like that. So I'm putting a lot of focus now on just consciously trying to develop that. I'm very happy to find these groups. Because <laughs> yeah, you want a structure. If you really want to develop, you need structure. And I, I recommend it highly that you have structure and not just uh, kind of winging it with a few people that want to try it out. Because that's just a recipe for picking up some bad habits and things like that. So I recommend to everyone to get some, uh, some books, learn, like I said, the basics, uh, terminology of a lot of things. And also, you know, I want to talk about observation uh, learning and skills. I think it's extremely important to develop your observation skills, okay? Because that's going to help you with the clairvoyance immensely. A lot of, I think a lot of you are probably clairsentient. I know you just said you're clairvoyant. Um, if you're clairsentient, that comes a little bit more naturally. It seems like clairvoyance, a lot of times uh, people develop it as they start to develop their, their gifts. And um, if you take observations, uh, different types of ob observation classes, uh, you don't have to take a class, but you can take a, um, have different practices. It, it, with me, it I took up drawing and painting. And after I did, my clairvoyance just went right through the roof. Within six months, it was like five years of development because I learned to um, observe something when I was painting it, you know, like the old expression, you paint grass, it's green. No, it's actually probably like, you know, 12, 15, 20 different colors of green you know, with the shading and stuff like that. And once you develop that, you'll start to see Aunt Rose in the color of uh, the necklace that she's wearing or her earrings. Um, you'll pick up those, that detail. And it only takes one or two of those little details for the person to say, oh my God, that's so-and-so. That's the evidential information that you all want to strive for, okay? You want to get evidential information, something that satisfies you so you know who it is. Because you can't give a reading, or I don't suggest you give a reading, you must know who's coming through. That's huge, okay? Because without that, it could be anyone. You know what I mean? It could be another spirit. It could be someone just jumping in and pretending to be someone else. It could be someone that's not doing it for bad things, but it just be that 
you got the wrong person. And then all of a sudden the reading takes on a whole different aspect because you brought in a cousin because you thought it was a sister or something. So it's important. That's one of the reasons why you want to get evidential information. If I don't get as evidential information within the first 10 minutes, I cancel the reading and I say, perhaps we'll do it again, or I will recommend someone else. Because it's spirit's responsibility too, to give you that information. Okay. And if they're giving you that information, the SID is not picking it up. Of course, we tell them to write things down or to record it um, because they will pick, you know, possibly pick up that information later on. We all do it. It's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Just hold on to it. it might make sense tomorrow. You know, usually nine out of 10 times, it does make sense. It's just, we call it like psychic amnesia or something like that. So um, you definitely want spirit to give you that information and they will. Um, and usually they show it to you two or three times. It's a lock on, you know, and a lot of times they won't move forward until the person recognizes it. So anyways, that's, you know, a lot of the real deal evidential mediums, that's what you want to be. You want to bring through something that you don't know, you couldn't have known, um, that the person will recognize. And by doing observational skills, you know, doing some type of game online or something like that, or I do it sometimes with flashcards, I'll hold up, um, if I'm doing a class, I'll hold up a, a, a picture of, um, I, last time I did it was a couple of Indians on a horse. And the people in the class, I will bring it by their view and it'll just be like a flash. And then I ask them, what did you see? And they write it down. And then at the second one, like a half hour later, I'll do it again. There'll be another flash, but not as quick. And then by the end of the class, it'll be a little bit slower and they'll start to pick these things up. And that's how you'll start to develop your clairvoyance and things because you'll start to pick up colors. You'll start to pick up forms. And then you'll start to pick up relationship like the two horses, okay? Once you start doing that, you're going to see your connection to spirit blossom and your, and your sitters are going to start to say, oh my God, that was so-and-so's horse or that was my mom's horse when she was little or something like that. So that's why it's important. And as you develop this, you won't even realize that some of the stuff that you're giving out, they're going to say, oh my God, that makes sense. That makes sense. And they're going to be pieces of evidence. So not everyone's going to have date of their birthday, their name, the street they lived on, their social security number. You know what I mean? A lot of people teach that you need this bing, 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 bing. No, if you're giving out certain things like this, they're all bits and pieces. And all of a sudden it starts to put a picture together like, wow, wait a minute. They couldn't Google this information. They would never know that. Those are the little things that will really set you apart from other people. But you'll get that satisfaction that you'll say to yourself, because you're always going to have trust issues at the beginning. You know what I mean? You're like, did my mind make that up? But when you give this stuff out, wait a minute, that had to be spirit. How did I know, you know, her aunt had, you know, the blue earrings or something like that, you know? So that's why it's important too for the evidence because you're, you'll be testing yourselves for the first few years. We all do it. You want to go for that evidence. Ask spirit. They will give you the, the evidence. You can, you can um, focus it down to one or two things if you want. I know when I started, when I started focusing down, I focused it on personalities personality traits. So I used to be sentient on that as opposed to my clairvoyance, meaning um, I could sense their, their the personality. Meaning, the other night I gave a lady and her mom came through and I could tell she was a old school, classy, well-kept woman by the way she was sitting up, the way her hair was, the way she was talking to me. All of that little stuff uh, clues on her personality, as opposed to someone that might come in and, you know, they might be all over the place, which is another clue of that type of personality. So that's one of the things I worked on was, was personality. Some people might want to know the cause of death. A lot of mediums teach that. I always stay away from that because I've been taught from spirit that they don't necessarily want to talk about that because it's really not a big deal. And it's kind of like, what do you mean? My body gave out. It's like, all right, you know, I had cancer or I got shot or something like that. It's, it's really not a big deal for them on the other side most of the time. So I don't usually ask that. Also, you know, I don't necessarily want to feel that pain they went through, but you can do that. You, if, you, if you want to try it and do it, they will show you. Um, you can say, I don't want to feel it, but show me. Many times I will um, ask them for that information 
if I'm not getting enough from the other ways I'm looking, you know, trying to get evidence and, you know, they'll, they'll, they might show me like a tourniquet and uh, um, chemo going in their arm or something like that. And then bang, you know, we got that. So um, that's, you can, so you pick different, different areas. Um, physical evidence, obviously that's like different um, physical items that were related to them um, that the sitter would recognize, okay? So that might be something they passed down, it might be jewelry, could be a car, could be um, anything like that. It could be, um, and then you go into to, to their profession or their passion. Let's say some of the guy was a collector, collected cars or collected baseball cars or something. That might come through. You could do something like that. And, um, you know, you start showing, I got baseball cards all over the place. Oh, my dad was a great collector of baseball cards. Bang. That's evidential information, you know. And then once you start to have that, those things, then you can go on to the message. Okay. So let's get the evidence first, then the message. Go ahead. I, I was going to ask you if this was something that you also do. It was from the group that I was in before, the person who led the group would always start out with, um, we would each bring some some picture of someone with a little story, or we would look at some cold cases from, you know, from the police department. And they would always say, the first question you would ask our group is, is this a ghost or a spirit? Because the way he looked at it was, if it's somebody that's crossed over, then they'll tell you the truth. But if it's someone who's earthbound and it's a ghost, that's someone who has the ability to lie to you. And so he, just to make sure that you had the right kind of situation. Okay, that, this is getting back to the foundation and knowing different terms and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the ghost is not necessarily, there are different different levels of, you know, what people call ghosts. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it can be a, um, it could be a time loop. Um, it, it, I don't like to use the firm ghost as a low level entity or anything like that. That's that's how people get things mixed up. Um, so asking you if it's a ghost or a spirit, that's, personally, I don't like that question because it's kind of a loaded question. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And um, I, I don't think it's going to help at all, okay? Because you're not going to contact a ghost, okay? If, if it's, I mean, there are ghosts that, there are entities that are connected to um, certain places. Um, and they might be um, um, continuing in that particular place, but at a different time, doesn't mean necessarily they're interacting with our side. Um, also, I mean, look at Gettingsburg. A lot of that yeah. are time stamp groups. So someone sees the same soldier every day at three o'clock, you yeah. know, walking up the stairs. That doesn't mean that soldier's still there or even part of his entity is still there. That, that might be a time loop. So it's, that's kind of a general ghost is a big general thing. And, and when you're dealing with mediaship and stuff, I mean, you shouldn't even, I mean, you want to separate yourself from the, the, the old paranormal ghost hunting stuff, okay? Yes. Because this stuff that you're doing is much more serious. It's much more um, profound. It's much more healing. You don't want to do that other stuff because a lot of that other stuff, it's a, you can get into that afterwards, but don't, pull, don't put them together because it's just going to confuse things, all right? So if mm -hmm. someone says, oh, you're feeling a ghost or a spirit, um, it's... That's not a good question, especially for beginners, okay? Because that your clear sentience is going to come out. You're going to pick up stuff from that environment to know if this is an entity connected to a building or stuff like that. So it gets into much more detail, you know what I mean? So that's not a good development question. I don't know who it is, but I just, I don't agree with that. Um, pictures are great. Pictures are great because you're trying to connect to that person, that energy. I would practice psychometry. Mm -hmm. You know what psychometry is? Please look it up. Um, or learn about it. It's the reading of uh, objects. Yes, I, it. Um, you, I have a lady that I'm mentoring right now, and I, that's what she's doing right now. She's getting things from her friends to, to do readings about the energy. Um, I suggest you don't get something from a used store or someplace you don't know necessarily know the history of, um, because you know there could be a lot of energies of different people connected with that object. And you might be hitting on them, but the person you, that gave it to you might have no idea. You know right. what I mean? So, but that's great. One-on-one, -on -one, doing the pictures um, in an envelope uh, or doing the psychometry. 
You could also uh, put a name on a piece of paper and put it in a you know a bag or a box. Let's mm -hmm. say you want each put a different name in there and then um, fold the paper. It's like billets, they call it in spiritual church, and you will pull out that uh, piece of paper without even looking at it because it'll be folded and see if you can bring it through that spirit. Okay. No mm -hmm. ghosts. You can, you're connecting the spirit. <laughs> That's why I asked. <laughs> yeah. You, you need to connect the spirits because, you know, they're here to help us too. And you don't want random energies trying to connect with them. Okay. So it's, you don't want to open yourself up to that because like they say, you can't, and that's why we do the evidence because we don't know if a jokester's around and they want to come through and, and give you information. Um, it, but more importantly, a lot of times we as mediums can screw it up because we're getting information from different relatives and we're just not figuring out who it belongs to. So mm -hmm. the person, it doesn't make any sense and actually the poor loved one is coming through with the information. And you, you can't make that connection. So that's why the evidence is important. Okay. Can I ask one more quick question? I saw that you are a Reiki master, and I am only a Reiki one. And I was wondering if the, the process or the journey to becoming a Reiki master, if that influences or helps you to kind of hone in on your skills as a medium. Yeah, I think doing any type of energy work absolutely does and i know a lady that had done uh, energy work for years and she's developing her mediumship this year uh, side of last year after her retirement and she's done it very quickly and i wasn't surprised because she's worked with energy for many many years for over 20 years so mm -hmm. it's a little bit where she can meditate a lot easier she she can tell the shifting of energy which is like the clear sentient you can tell if someone when someone comes in you know what i mean now she's learning the techniques of figuring out male female with the personalities, the evidential things, but she's, she was already ahead of the game, you know, by having that energy yeah. practice, which is great. I, 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 I took a, um, my first Reiki one just because someone wanted me to work in a, um, she wanted me to work in hospice. And so I said, cause I wasn't going to take it. I'm like, Oh, you know, I've done uh, hands-on healing in the churches and I learned that energy and things like that. And, um, but they wanted a certificate before you could work in there. And it's very understanding because they want people that know the boundaries of what you can touch, where mm -hmm. uh, it's the foundation you need that. You just don't want to go willy nilly into something and um, it, it makes things uncomfortable for other people. So, um, yeah, mine was actually taught by a nurse who worked for the hospital um, for, for hospice as well. That's I think there were nine people in my first class and seven of them were nurses. And so I started studying on that and um, I didn't realize they, well, they call it therapeutic touch, you know, mm -hmm. in the hospital and that there were a lot of hospitals in my area that had been doing it for years, like literally for like 10, 20 years. And that was back in the nineties and things like that, which was cool. Um, some grandmothers do it when just when you put your hand on someone when they're That's not, all, yeah. the energy transfer is natural. It's there. anyone who's ever held a crying baby knows that it works. Because Absolutely. the energy coming from their mother stops it. Right. And, you know, you just hit, you can give it to yourself, too. Obviously, you know that. And you can feel it transfer. Um, and, you know, when I did my development, I'm very analytical. And me and my buddy, you know, that I had met, um, we were both analytical about it. And we were like, you know, we're going to test this out. And when it came to the energy and the hands-on healing, we felt kind of like, oh, this is just bull. Until we experienced it, we're like, whoa, there's something here. Let's do this. You know, it's kind of like we were like kids. We still are trying to experiment and find different things. And, you know, long story short, when I did that um, hospice thing and we laid hands on this lady or over her just because she was unconscious at that point. She was going to pass any day. Um, and, of course, Curiosity Joe, I opened up. And I, you know, set, I wanted to see if any of her relatives were around. You know what I mean? So I could mediumship-wise see what's going on. Lo and behold, I, I open up and the lady comes to me. She's like five feet off the bed looking at me. And I'm like, whoa, this is wow. interesting. Unbelievable. So she kept on saying, that's not me. I'm here. This is me. That's not me. This is me. And I, I said, say, absolutely. She You're said, right. I know it's you. And she was like, oh, you can see me? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so we had this little bit of a conversation. I'm like, this is better than the relatives. 
you know, because yeah. the only thing I didn't understand was this lady looked like she was probably in her late thirties, nice brown hair, beautiful face, makeup, the whole nine yards. And the lady in the bed, to me, she looked like she was like in her sixties. She was bald. She had had brain cancer and uh, with all the chemo and stuff like that. And afterwards, uh, when we came out and, you know, um, beginning, we were getting ready to leave. Actually, I think I, we did leave when I asked one of the ladies over oh, we right near the door. I said, I told them what happened. And they're like, oh my God. They're like, Joe, there's a picture behind the, all the, the uh, plants over on near the window. Grab that. So I went over there and I picked up a picture and it had a couple of dogs on it. And I showed them and the girl said, no, no, not that one. There's one over underneath. And I pulled, pulled out a, a photograph and there was six women in it, like a, a girl's night out or like a... You know, people at college that have a reunion type thing. And I looked at it, I said, oh my God, this is the lady second from the right. And uh, her uh, niece said, that's so-and-so. That's Mary. That's right. Her name was Mary. She said, I'm getting a chill. She said, that's Mary. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Mary is 39. And um, so she came, I'm getting a wicked chill. But that's a great, it, it just, things like that will happen to you as you develop. And you put yourself out there, you know, and um, those are defining, you'll have those moments in your life that'll just blow you away. And these are the things that will separate you from other people because you're willing to take a shot and experience these things for yourself. You know, something like that, and I put that in one of my books, goes a long way to explaining certain things because the more experience you have actually being involved in these experiences, um, you can share them from the first person. It's not like you read it, and, oh, someone said this, or this happens, or the ghost jumped out the window or something like that. It's something that happened to you, and then you can qualify it by talking to other people, like, what do you think that was? You know, what was this? It, you know what I mean? And, and then yeah. you can kind of come to a little more personal uh, conclusions, and, you, and your analytical brain will be like, wait a minute, this really happened. And, and pe hospice nurses have loads of stories like that. Another quick one, too. I just got to tell you, a friend of mine, uh, this lady, her best friend was a hospice worker, and um, they were with a patient and um, getting ready to cross over. And the patient, um, they saw what looked like um, a mist come from the body, raise up, and go towards the corner of the room. This was the nurse. And she turned to the gentleman next to her and said, did you just see what I saw? And the gentleman said, yes, I did. And she said, thank you, Father. There was a Catholic priest next to it. And he admitted that he just saw that. Now, you read some of the old timers books and they will explain some of that mist and how um, people can see it, verify it when it leaves the body. Um, so that's a first person. Now he's a first person. It's like, you know, a hospice nurse I trust and a priest to admit it standing mm -hmm. next to him. That's something that really makes you go, okay, there's something really to this, you know, as opposed to like, you know, Ghost hunt is with a magnifier or something. So, oh, you know, it just drives me insane. Sorry. This is serious stuff to me. You know, it, it's, you know, if they want to do that, that's fine. It's fine. Because, you know, there will be times where people will want readings that are going to be uncomfortable for you. Okay. You know, you can have people that are in bad situations of, you know, in crisis that are going to need your help. And that's when the rubber meets the road. And they don't need any any stuff that, um, you know, you see on these TV shows and stuff like that. And um, they want the compassion and they want um, the best of you. And, and that's what you'll give them. And you'll also learn to be discerning because you will have people whose relatives come through that were alcoholics. They might have been molesters. They might have been um, abusers. Um, they might have... Uh, cheated on their wives, they, they might be children that actually were an abortion. That's happened to me. This is stuff that you, you know, it's because you're dipping your toe into something that's really, really wild. It's the big picture. It's the big picture. Yeah. So that's why, that's why I love it because what else could, I mean, what else could be so cool than doing something like this? And you're supposed to be doing it. Every one of you is supposed to be doing it. Yeah, that was my question about Reiki was that I have trouble kind of focusing on one thing to develop. And that's why I'm kind of, that's what I'm kind of trying to do. That's a great, you know, something and that, that I run into that a lot. And 
the lady that's doing the mediumship now that was doing the energy work before, she was one of these people that would be like taking every energy class. And then she finally got down into like one or two things and that was her gig. Because a lot of times we people take classes and they just take class after class after class. And they'll take it in like 10 different modalities and then they'll go from that and then they want to be a medium and they get bored with that. So they want to do something else. It's like anything in life, you know, it's kind of like pick a lane. You know, if you, if you want to be a baseball, you know, superstar, then you're going to have to put down the bowling ball and pick up the baseball more often. Whatever you feel most comfortable with and what resonates with you. Uh, that's usually, hey, you got to use your gut instinct. You're using it when you make your connections. We use it in our daily lives, even people that aren't doing development, obviously. Most of us don't use it as often as we should, you know, because it's one of the things that we brought with us to this plane of existence is our intuition. It's our connection to our spiritual source, which is connected to our guides. And um, a lot of times when we shut that off for various reasons, we lose that contact where we can um, get help with our questions, our answers, and our experiences in life. You know, I think a lot of people, especially in this day and age with all the different communications and the short attention span that we've gotten away from that, you know. Let's bring up the, the Reiki. I get to tell my Reiki, my Reiki story, my hospice Reiki story, which is uh, Mary, I still remember. I could still, that's another thing too. When you guys do readings and stuff and you start to get a little bit more into it and you're getting um, scenes um, or how someone feels and the whole nine yards, those, a lot of those readings are going to stay with you for 20, 30 years. I can remember readings like they were yesterday that were 15 years ago, certain parts of them, okay? I don't know how they do it. A lot of times, the short-term memory, it's not there. But the long-term memory, it's there. If that makes any sense. It's a consciousness. I don't know. That's, that's higher than my pay grade, the whole consciousness thing, too. But I just know what, what works and how it happens. Okay. So my question is, how do you know um, that it, you're not, if you're connected to um, spirit, that some of it, the information coming in isn't psychic, um, mm -hmm. that you're reading the person as well. Right. You, what you should do, the, and the more you practice and stuff, you will feel a distinct difference between giving a psychic reading and a mediumistic reading. With a mediumistic reading, you will start to feel male or female energy. You might feel an age. Um, that clear sentient you will have, you'll start to form a, a picture or a feeling of what that energy is with a psychic reading you won't feel that okay you, you you'll start to feel more uh concepts in, in um in, in things to that matter as opposed to a particular entity does that okay. make sense if i it does make sense um can i tell you the situation where yeah. i was wondering um, the person, the sitter wasn't sitting in front of me. I was meeting her the next day, but I wanted to connect to her energy the night before. So I connected to her energy and I started to take notes and with building that trust, just put it on paper. There's no pressure. She's not in front of me. So it was a way of putting myself in the space where there wasn't pressure. Um, and then I connected with um, what felt like her mother instantly and I didn't don't know didn't know anything about this girl the sitter that I was meeting so I'm like I don't know okay just write it down this is just what I'm getting um so I did get information but then I was shown a memory and then I was like well is that from her mom or is that from the the girl the sitter um so right. that why and it was like a whole scene of this memory right well, see, that's, that's a really great question because that can happen because you don't know if you're switching off from the mom or the mom's showing you the scene. Mm -hmm. um, in that particular situation, I would just write down the information, okay? You know how it felt, and then when you talk to her, um, you know, if there's a related, and she says, oh, well, that scene relates to my mom, then you kind of know, you know what I mean? Um, and if it's not, you know, it's more of a psychic pickup, but then you remember the next time it happens, that, that adjustment you will feel, okay? That's why it's so important to practice, 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 because you will, um, you will learn to discern between the two. Just like you'll be able to discern between um, uh, a guide and, a, and a, a relative, okay? 
if you want to meet your guides and your medium when you're doing your meditation and stuff like that, you'll be able to tell the difference between a guide and a relative. Okay. It just, it takes practice, but you'll start to feel it because, you know, when a relative comes through, the more you practice with your quesetti and stuff like that, their personality and their type is really going to, that's the first thing that you're going to recognize. And through the observation, they, they don't have to say anything. I've had a young man come in, cross his legs, tall, nice dap of pants, and just cross his arms and just stand there. I say that, to me, that brings out a personality. This person's laid back. He's so cool. He's got nothing to worry about, and he's just waiting for his turn to come through. And then the person says, oh, yeah, that's my, you know, my brother. And well, he was always so nice and considerate, never stepped forward. And then all of us, you know, it makes sense. But you'll pick that up, but it just takes practice. You know, another thing, too, is when you're doing psychometry, you'll pick up the energy, which is like a psychic energy. Sometimes you will pick up um, the person that belongs to. They might try to come in. Just because, that. yeah, just because they're like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> the front door is open. I'm coming through. You know what I mean? So they might bodge through, and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm just picking up, uh, you know, I'm picking up a World, II, World War II fighter, and, and then all of a sudden I have a man here. Um, but that will happen, too, because they want to come through, you know, so sometimes some people are more pushy than others. Um, so sometimes they, you will get the psychic and the mediumship a little bit mixed up, but that's something that's just, you have to walk through and you have to uh, experience it. And then once you do, you, you'll be able to tell, but it comes with practice. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. We're at the hour now. And I'd just like to just check are you running any classes at the moment or can people contact you about finding a class or, me or individual mentoring and also about your books? Okay, yeah, I'm not running a class sp uh, specifically right now, but if anyone wants to contact me, um, I can help them with uh, their development and any questions you might have. I love reaching out to people. I think it's wonderful that we can help each other because um, it's, it's difficult. It, it's a lonely road sometimes being a medium. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I, you know, what I really want to say is mediumship to me is very, very sacred. Um, and that's why a lot of times, I mean, I've done a couple of parties and things like that. And um, I won't do them anymore because that's more of entertainment. I did them for the experience, but I won't do them anymore because I've, I've been there, done that. And it, to me, it's more sacred, the connection. Um, and I think, um, when you start to think about it that way, it'll, you'll feel much more positive about what you're doing um, because that's the ultimate thing is, is, is the sacred connection that you have. But you guys can contact me any, anytime you want. I'll help you out. If you're looking for a teacher or, or specific uh, types of things, I can point you in the right directions, what teachers I like, what teachers uh, meditations that I go to that I like, um, all that stuff. So let's not be strangers, you know? Okay, Joe, thank you so much today. I think you've been absolutely inspiring. And uh, your, your email address is in the chat box, josephmhiggins.com at gmail.com. So uh, I think that's a very generous offer and we will certainly be in touch. And I hope you'll come back again because I think, I think your experience and your wisdom is just invaluable.